the SEL project, I've sent emails to uh, or I sent emails to most of the groups. There's a few more groups that I've spoken to to finish responding to later today, just to confirm your uh, choice on the project. And then we'll uh, post a memo later this afternoon on the course website that just talks a bit more about the expectations on what the report's contents are and when those meetings with me and Alicia will be next week. So just on that, those meetings are intended for us to uh, give you feedback, but also it's a graded meeting. So your chairman skills, if you've been practicing through uh, six assignments up to now, presumably you'll be rotating the chairs amongst the members of the group so you can get practice. One of you will be elected as the chair, uh, uniting the meeting, you'll send me and Paul Alicia a proposed structure for the meeting, and you'll stick to that structure and up, the purpose of the meeting is for myself and Alicia to give you feedback on the project and the, your plan for it coming in the next few weeks. Now I will also add though that um, in terms of the SDL project scope, I've decided to cut it back a little bit, mainly because I feel I've, I've given you enough load of work for the six assignments up to now. So for the previous years there were fewer assignments, but then you had a larger SDL project. My approach with all my courses is standard to load up more frequent assignments, so you get frequent exposure to material and, and frequent feedback, and then less at the end. So I'll do the same with the SDL project scope. Compared to previous years, it will not be as significant. So that big SDL project pop, uh, report I posted to the course website, that's the larger piece of work that you'll probably require to do for this, uh, for this year. So, so look for that memo later today on the course website. The other is, uh, the other membership point is next week Thursday we have a guest lecture, uh, Dr. Murphy from the School of uh, Engineering Practice, where we get to talk about entrepreneurship and innovation. So near the start of the course I had asked uh, for a little, uh, I had a questionnaire on the website that you filled out and many of you had that uh, you were interested in understanding a bit more about small businesses, perhaps starting your own business, what is entrepreneurship and innovation all about. Uh, so he's, he's, a, he's a good guy to talk about this. He started his own company um, and now works at the university full time teaching these tools to the, uh, to the people in the School of Engineering Practice. So next week, Thursday, uh, come with questions. I've asked him to talk for about 30 minutes or so, 30 to 40 minutes, and then there'll be time, time for questions. And then also because he's on campus, you're available to speak to him afterwards at any time, but then at least that way you've met him. Okay, then uh, the other thing I thought I'd just show is, I was surprised by this. Uh, this came out in the Global Mail. Uh, this week, I think a lot over the weekend. So we've been looking at this topic in the course, uh, what's the value of an engineering degree? And so here's Cambridge median salary, uh, age 26 to 35. So starting a few years after if you graduate, uh, that would be a typical salary to earn compared to a high school graduate there of 32,000. So male, male. Uh, you can go through this list and go through various other degrees. So say civil engineering, for example, that changes to 60,000. If you studied law, uh, 56. Cambridge is the highest one on that list. Of all the ones I went through, Cambridge was the highest one on the list. Philosophy. I'll post the link to the website. But this is this is what shocked me the most about this and upset me the most about this is this is the In that age range, 26 to 35, females are out of the workforce for a few years if they're having children, and so the median salary of females is lower than males. But that's, that's if you're out of the workforce, you're stagnating in terms of your income earnings. It's not a sexist thing. If you choose not to have children and follow a career, 
taught that way that you shouldn't have the same concrete combos. But that differential of the forty thousand dollars is the largest differential as well. So any ideas why? I don't know the answer. Why is it you realize the metric on the two the back to like the mail and point to the bottom of the but for other careers, it's uh, not as strong. For sure, there's a time, time uh, working time period. If you go to law, say that the pressure is 7,000. Or 2,000 is just a university application. So, anyways, it's interesting numbers. I'll uh, post the link to the course website. And, uh, Okay, so uh, I want to also just take a look at this. Uh, this ties in with the previous assignment that you just put this ability to tweet. Uh, this is related to steam generation, so uh, I should check again. This is important to understand, it's not covered really at all in any of our courses, and I wasn't even really aware of this too much until about a while and I've used a client this week, explained it a bit more carefully. So companies will tend, especially petrochemical companies, they have requirements for steam at different pressures, so high and low pressure, as you saw in the drying oil example. Um, but that's not just simply you adjust the pressure on, 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 the, on the line and that's it. I mean, we have to think about how this is created. It's a, it's a manufacturing facility all on the job in most sites and it's very complex and can be um, can be actually a, a big loss maker to a company if not done properly. So what companies will do is they have fuel, oil, or gas, or typical natural gas, and they'll burn on a different purpose. So they'll, they grow their number of burners over time as they as they capacity needs to change. So for example, in this case, if we take our existing company and they now decide to expand into drying oil, they're going to add these extra units on, there's increased demand for steam at the site. They may need to purchase a, an extra burner V5 and add that in parallel to the sequence. Those burners, they all take water, boil a few water, which has been just cleaned out of, uh, of ions and other, other contaminants, then to boil it and provide high pressure steam. So we create high pressure steam. We don't create medium and low pressure steam. The steam is created at a single high pressure. And there may be a number of consumers in the site that require high pressure. So this consumer there isn't just one person, it's a number of, of, of uh, units in the site that will require high pressure. Mm -hmm. To generate a uh, low pressure, a medium pressure, then we would use turbines to let down that steam from high pressure to medium pressure. And that turbine's work is then recovered. So we can drive pumps with this, we can generate electricity with this potentially. We can, we're getting a credit for our expense here. So we pay money to, uh, to in fuel oil costs. But then we get some of that back by being able to generate useful work over here that can be um, applied to drive pumps and so forth. We can then also have turbines that take that down from high pressure to low pressure or uh, intermediate turbines that take from medium to low pressure. So depending on our needs, we can turn these turbines on and off depending on where the plant's capacity is at and what the needs are. So if we've got low pressure needs that then suddenly come up, we're turning on new equipment, we may need to then turn on this turbine that was previously off to then let down some medium pressure steam down to Or conversely, we may have a unit, a heat exchanger, that's producing medium pressure steam or low pressure steam for us that we pump back into those headers. So we get credits for those incoming steam as well internally. Um, we have heat exchangers out here in the site that, uh, that will take this turbine over here, either one of them, those turbines then can be, they will let down partially to low pressure steam, but we can even go through another heat exchanger and uh, use that to heat up another stream in the site and then cool down our stream and just bring it down to condensate. So we have these multiple levels. And this can be pretty complex. This document, in fact, is uh, Dr. Marlin uh, set it up as a GAMS optimization problem where 
you can put the production needs of the site in as your inputs, and then you can calculate what your credits are from the turbines over here and from your, your medium and low pressure producers coming back in. And you, you set it up as an economic optimization problem. <coughs> it's a linear programming problem that can then be solved. And the companies that do this well solve this linear programming problem in real time. So they institute what are called real-time optimizers that will turn on and off those turbines to maximize the process economics. So your objective function is maximize profit, so income from your steam generators, income from your turbine energy that you, uh, that you get, minus the expense. And you can, you can optimize those in real time and make decisions on whether to turn turbines on and off and at what, at what levels to do that. So it's a, it's a many plant on its own line. So I, we need to understand this and when we're casting steam is that it's not just a pure process of the feed water and the natural gas, but then we also get credits for any of the streams we produce back. So if we produce medium pressure or low pressure steam, we credit that back to ourselves. Or if we uh, get turbine work out of it and drive pumps, then that pump, we don't have to pay electricity costs for it. So you have to see this as an integrated part of the plant as well. So I thought I'd just uh, take a look at that. Uh, any questions on, on that, all the assignments that we just, just submitted? So, did you say that the water gets used again after it's condensated? So, condensate, yes. Yeah, there is a net loss of water through the system. Uh, some steam, as we'll talk about today, in flaring, you lose steam through your process. You vent it to the atmosphere, or it's used as a consumable in one of your reactors if you require H2O. Uh, so, you may use, you, you definitely will use up steam, so you're always bringing in new water feed water. Right? If you look at an overall mass balance on it. Okay, so there's a bit more about this in that article I posted on the, on the course website. Then um, the other, so today's class is actually just a collection of different loose ends, and then we'll move on to hazard in the next class. I thought just to tie up uh, a lot of, of, of open ends that I, I think we need to cover before we move on. But uh, as we'll see, the, the class today leads naturally into hazards on, on Thursday. So. The other point I just wanted to cover was here related to the safety hierarchy. These are in your slides um, that Dr. Marlin covered, not most recently, but just the section prior to talking about pressure relief. There were four slides numbered 36, 37, 38, and 39 um, in your notes. And then, so this is the slide just prior. I think this is slide 36, looks something like this. Um, the reason why I'm pointing this out is that these are important slides for you to work through at your own time. It's, uh, it's two case studies. One is on this, uh, one is on this drawing. And then it's asking you to you know, review that distillation process and identify the safety layers. So let's just recall that uh, Dr. Marley was talking about the four safety layers, the basic process control system that's running at very high frequency, millisecond execution times, uh, run by automated uh, control loops that, that work really fast and rapidly. And these are opening and closing valves <coughs> and final control elements, manipulating the process to obtain steady operation. <coughs> and they're obtaining steady operation because they're rejecting disturbances such as ambient temperature changes, ambient pressure changes. There's raw material variation coming into your process. So all this disturbance type variables that you learned about in QP and, and the fourth theory control course that you took that. Uh, all these disturbances are continuously being rejected by the continuous control system. So that's a normal part of our day-to-day -day operation. We, we expect that to happen because we have variation from our raw materials and other sources all the time coming in. Then we have above that another layer, the alarm system, and the key here was to use independent sensors for the alarm system. And these would then alert the operators when, when, um, when unusual conditions are occurring, so above normal or below normal. And I think the main point that I would emphasize there from Dr. Marling's part of the course was too many alarms are just like crying wolf the whole time. And unfortunately, I, I can't recall one control room that I've been in ever where there's not something going on every few minutes or seconds. 
every control room I've ever been in is always just so many alarms. I find that um, when, we, when we're looking at, you'll see coming up now next in the hazard studies, trying to identify hazards, we tend to be overly cautious in the sense that uh, we say we put our levels too tight for our balance. And that's natural, right? We'd rather say, I'd rather be safe than sorry. So we tend to have that tendency as engineers. Unfortunately, it leads to a control uh, room and an operator or operators that are dealing with multiple flashing lights and not, not sure where to, to put their attention. So there's, a, there's always a drawback. And it, it also just comes back to statistics. So, so for those of you that have taken 4C with me or those that might, yeah, I guess all of you that have been a class would have taken it if you, if you were going to before you graduate, you, we learned about type 1 and type 2 errors. So the, there's always a trade-off. You can never have low type 1 errors, low false alarms, and you cannot have low type 2 errors simultaneously. You always are trading off between one and the other. Either you're going to err on the side of caution too much, or you're going to never pick up the alarm if you need to. So, but there is a balance. There is a minimum that we, we can, can achieve, but it's hard to calculate. So unfortunately, we lead with, we are left with alarm systems that are too frequent. Then above that, we have another layer, independence, that will interrupt the process and take you out of regular production. So you would potentially upset your process here and create a product that's off spec, you can't sell and you have to dispose of in some way, or recycle through the, through the system. So anytime your SIS is activated, it's definitely costing you money. It's shutting down a unit, it's turning things off to safe operation, trying to find a safe parking place to move that reactor or a safe position to move the system, but it's going to cost you money. We don't ideally like that to happen. So this is an automated layer that interrupts your process. Then the final layer um, before we reach containment is the relief layer. So here we're, we're uh, diverting material to, to a containment system. And the key issue here is that the relief layer is totally independent of the three layers below it. And further, it does not rely on electrical power for it to work. So the relief layer is a purely mechanical layer with no electrical requirements at all. It has to work under all conditions. So, so that's, the, that's the, the, the safety layer that uh, Tom is talking about over here. So locate examples of those in that drawing. And he says that if it's missing, add it. Um, then evaluate the examples that you find. By that it means, is it effective? Is it going to work? Or how would you change it? And remember, he said that there may be errors in, in that thought. So take a look at those um, in your own time. This will be good practice for the final exam. Um, and then there's a second one as well for a fire heater. Same, same idea. So those were the last four slides in the section on the safety hierarchy that we, that we can go through. Any questions on the topics that Dr. Marlin spoke about? We're going to uh, continue on with the parts he had, but before we do that, I thought um, so. I felt it important to just review the tutorial that we did last class because this is so. This basically now in the class would be essentially the, the solution to that workshop, and I just uh, we'll put put the slide up here again to, to guide our discussion. Um, I just wanted to get from from you. We looked at the good things about that flow sheet, and uh, sorry about this uh, about the system. Things that the engineers or, or operators had done that were were good, but uh, potentially still failed. So that list was fairly short for most of you. And then we looked at the long list of, of things that were poorly executed. So let's take a look at those. What were some of the good things? Anything that was worthwhile that was done in a, in a manner that. We had just learned about in the past four classes. There were high level alarms on what were the High level alarms on the tanks. So you're referring to the blow the down the and the reef. Or the raft and tower, yeah. So there were high level alarms, but they failed. 
Okay, so we had them, but they failed, and that was the maintenance issue. Yeah. Redundant pressure safety valves. Redundant pressure relief valve, you're referring to those three in here in parallel up there. So we had those redundant safety relief over there and the manual chain valve that was, was open. So those were good. Anything else that was good? Uh, the heat exchanger used already hot bottoms to heat up the feet, so it saved them energy. Okay, so from a, from a uh, systems integration point of view, having that heat exchanger is a good idea. We're saving energy here. But we saw that during the startup sequence, that actually led to a, one of the, the contributing factors was that you're now sending a lot of heat back into this tower, and you're boiling this liquid, creating a huge pressure driving force that's essentially moving your material through <coughs> out to the knockout drum. Okay, so during startup, that actually worked against us. We often find that actually counterintuitively, uh, we, we get for steady state operation, for, re, for good regular operation, Heat integration works really well, it saves us money, but it's it's hard to get past that and safely during a startup mode. You have to think really, really carefully how you're going to start up when you have an integrated energy system uh, to prevent to prevent issues like that. So this is going to come up in the hazard and operability studies that we look at. Great to have energy integration and, and these cost savings, but how do you start up the process? safely to avoid any bad events happening. Ready? But I don't see how that would have affected the startup because well, they kept the tower essentially closed off on the bottom screen because it, it was rising, right? Right. So I don't think that that would have slowed down the startup in terms of regular operation. In this case, obviously, it didn't work. Right. One thing, okay, so good point, uh, but one thing that is done, and we'll see this coming up in the operability section, is we should have a bypass around that for startup, so that we don't send hot feed into that tower. Okay, so well, that's, that would have definitely helped put less energy into the system, you would get less boiling, that boiling caused the pressure to move the material, this is a, a, a good diagram here. We're moving this material out through the relief, out to the, um, we're knocking it down, out, out first here to liquid and vapor, and then that, that started to overflow. So if we had less pressure in there, it would have potentially bought us a bit more time. Potentially, we can't say for sure. Because the operators and, and the voiceover that said in the video, there was absolutely no indication to the operator that this tank was, was, was filling up. There was nothing that uh, he could have possibly done differently. So there was absolutely no blame on the operator in this, uh, in this instance. He was essentially running a lot. Anything else that was good? Right, so a redundant, a redundancy of the side glass, so you could measure the level, but again, we asked, did it function well? No, in this case it didn't. So we had a lot of good things, the level alarms, the side glass, the redundancy of, of pressure measures, but um, uh, sort of level measures, but they failed at the time due to bad maintenance. Okay, so not too much that was good. They, uh, sorry, another good thing to note is uh, we mentioned those safety levels up there, but it's also it was a good, good idea to have it here on the reflux. So then the list of bad. So this one should be easy for you. Things that are bad and could have been done better. Calibration of the uh, level. Calibration of the level. So they had those, those uh, maintenance work orders out for them yeah. that were filled in as, as completed. Um, now, I, I must just also update half the class. Unfortunately, Dr. Marlin, when he did the morning session the tutorial, there was one section of the video he skipped over um, that the afternoon class saw that the, the morning class didn't. But So just to update half of you, um, there was a part of the video that showed how a lot of the sensors were, had maintenance work orders open for them. But those orders were closed as being completed without the work being done. So that was one of the major discoveries was 
for example, maintenance on some of those level sensors and alarms was noted as being completed but hadn't actually been executed. So those sensors were, were not in a, in a working state, uh, but could have, could have been. Okay. Now is the context of that that they hadn't actually gone and done the work, or they had gone and they were under, under the impression that it was working? So the, as the voiceover said in the, in, the, in the video, there's a checkbox mentality. They just kind of said, yes, we've done it without it actually being done, or verified that it's been done by a second person. Okay. So what you'll find is that an industry like oil and gas tends to be uh, less regulated. If you worked in something like in foods or pharmaceuticals, those of you who've worked in those environments know that there's always two operators that sign off on every piece of work. So the first one does the work, the second operator verifies the work has been done, and that goes into the batch record and is archived. It can always be requested by the FDA or Health Canada or the inspection agency that's relevant for that industry. Oil and gas industry has no such regulatory body. It's self-regulated. So they tend to have less, less or more lax uh, behavior for that. Anything else that was really badly designed or um, didn't work out? There's lots here, so this should be an easy discussion. They should have used a flare instead of the blow down drum. Absolutely, yeah. We're, we're going to talk a bit about flares now coming up. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Stronger communication. Uh, as, the, as I noted, there should be written communication uh, or less cryptic communication, as you saw there in that logbook entry, made almost no sense. Um, so they, they obviously talk in a language that they're all comfortable with, but still that logbook entry was very cryptic. Yeah. Uh, residential areas and access to the <coughs> as far as possible away from the uh, primary. Right. So the location, particularly of the trailers um, in the in the vicinity, uh, was problematic. And then the residential area. That's an interesting one. Actually, uh, we didn't see this in the video, but uh, Dr. Marlin has here. Dr. Marlin did read that 900-page report <laughs> and was stating there that the BP Amoco guidelines for the effects of the blast were more conservative and the American Petroleum Institute's predictions. So they did do a blast evaluation, but they came to the conclusion that that radius of the blast effect was very, very much, much smaller than what the API, the Petroleum Institute, uh, which is a, a body that's, that the oil and gas industry looks to for guidance on safety issues. Um, but they, their API estimates were much, much worse. So um, the internal numbers were much, much smaller than what API's numbers were. So that was, uh, that was a, a bad, bad engineering there. But then also that location of the trailers, firstly too close and made from wood. So that trailer effectively becomes a missile that kills the person inside it uh, when that explosion occurs. Yeah. Um, there's like lack of proper supervision. From? Just from like the, for the operators, like people are just like moving like early. Right, so bad management, bad management of, or we have bad behavior of the supervising startups leader. And then the lack of the supervisor during a startup sequence, when that operator's attention should be primarily focused on startup, and then yet he still had three other major units to, to supervise. Anything else? Um, right, so that, that whole unit was designed for, you know, for many years ago for another liquid composition and then had now been uh, repurposed. So that's a big issue. We'll see this over and over in your career that existing equipment is repurposed for new use. And then the assumption is that the safety for that original design still carries over. Yeah, that must be reevaluated. So it's not just reusing it and making sure that you can work, use it, but also the safety issues need to be revisited as well. Anything else? Maybe from the startup procedure was so normal that they didn't think of it as a problem, so they did Right, so, and, and so we mentioned that in the tutorial as well, that these procedures constantly deviated, so basically the deviation becomes the new procedure essentially. Whether it's tacitly assumed or officially sanctioned, it doesn't matter. Um, what should have been done is that the procedure should have been in place for startup. And one thing is to also have level sensors that span a wider range that are used during startup. 
So use a, a different sensor. You don't want to use the same sensor that you regularly use for feedback control. So remember the regular feedback control sensor said operate between <coughs> six and nine feet of liquid in that bottom of the tower. And that's the sensor that's used for regular feedback control. So it has good resolution and good characteristics for regular behavior. But during startup, you're exceeding that nine feet. So have a redundant sensor that is used for startup only that spans a wider range, will have lower resolution, but will still span that wider range then, and that can be safely used for startup sequencing until you get to a, a operation and you can switch over from that level sensor to the regular feedback control level sensor. So that would be a far better design for that. Um, for that. Anything else? The computer monitors they were using is that it didn't have like the feeds in and out of the tower on the same screen as you compared to. Right, so very bad visualization of your data. Um, and this is a common theme. You'll see this as well if you look at control room. The layout is extremely cluttered with any, without much thought in the human's eye and the human's eye to catch unusual operation, or just simply the lack of the relevant information being on the screen. Or if the relevant information is available, you may have to take four or five clicks to get to it, changing screens or changing parameters to get to the information you need. So you don't have it available to you in that split second that you really need to see it. So good, good design of these interfaces is critical. And having a totalizer that can show you the total volume dosed to the tower over a period of time would be useful. Not useful during regular operation, because then the total number is just going to get larger and larger. But at least during startup sequence, you can have a totalizer that shows the total volume fed. There must be a feed flow rate meter here. And we know the tower's cross-sectional area, so we can easily compute the height of, of liquid fed to the tower and, and estimate it that way. Or at least just the total volume of flow of feed to the tower. Knowing its density, then we can back calculate what we fed to the tower. So all, any number of those combinations could work successfully just during startup. Okay. So what I'll do is uh, just end there, but I will um, just uh, mention here, there's a paragraph from BP's final report that said, the hazards of overfilling distillation towers were not well understood by Texas city management. However, overfilling incidents in the industry have been well documented prior to that. So there's a distillation column expert, you may have used his textbook if you studied distillation column, is Henry Kister, 2003 wrote a report, so two years prior to this wrote a report that analyzed 900 case studies of distillation columns and found that most of the problems that occurred were always at the tower base. More than any other problem that ever occurred in those 900 case studies were always at the tower base. And of those problems, more than half were due to high liquid level. So this is a known issue in the industry. Um, it's, not, it's not something that we're blind to. He reports then that uh, high level, several incidents where high level led to liquid discharges into the tower overhead. In the United Kingdom, there are 718 incidents, they call them euphemistically loss of containment incidents. So any loss of containment incident gets reported, 718 of them were reviewed. They found that overflow of liquid into the overhead, so you're filling up your entire column and bringing liquid into your overhead stream. That's the second most reported cause for loss of containment. So this is not a new issue to the industry at all, um, and, and it certainly shouldn't have been to any qualified engineers that attend regular conferences and that regularly keep themselves up to date with, um, with trends in the industry, uh, which and should have been aware of this as being a major issue. So, um, a lot of things that we can in hindsight say we should have known, we could have known, um, but it's still, it's still, it's just, this case study just really, uh, just like strikes me personally because there's so many things that went wrong all at the same time. Um, so any one of those things that didn't go wrong could have actually prevented it. So it's a, you'll see this also if you look at, at, at safety literature or if you work in a company, you'll be trained on safety issues they'll often draw this sort of 
type of diagram that's the second permit, where these are incidents that occur regularly. These are your near misses. Um, every one of these near misses that can be prevented, you essentially, if I can reduce the, this number to a smaller amount, I can make this tower smaller. So if I can reduce the number of incidents, these are not, these are trivial incidents that don't lead to loss of any sort of health issue or uh, safety issue, I can make this permit smaller. This axis here represents risk. So this ultimate down here would be killing people. So if I can reduce this number down here of regular day-to-day -day misses, I can shrink that and I never actually reach the stage where I'm killing my neighbors or killing my operators. So it comes down to this. Any one of these things that could have been prevented, regular maintenance, uh, sensors, all, the, all these issues that we've looked at uh, could have potentially stopped it from getting to that apex. For what reason is, like, why couldn't that just shrink and narrow in? Uh, I, I'm not sure. The, the, this sort of triangle shape comes from just a study of safety incidents in different countries. So they've looked at it, and it's always that there's a proportion as you go from one layer to the next that, that seems to hold consistently. So unfortunately, I don't know what every layer is. Um, we, I had this in safety courses in Glaxo when we lived. So the one layer I know is, is things like the slips, trips, and falls, the smaller incidents, and then as you go higher up, it's ultimately more catastrophic. But then in those numbers, the, the width of the base is always in a, in, a, in a ratio. Like a lot of companies, they'll advertise their, like their safety records, but what they record are basically the near misses. Yeah. And you, you see this great number, but it's not necessarily reflected on the higher risk um, situations that occur. Right. There is, a, there is a definite proportionality to the number of near misses to the number of at the top though. For sure there is, because a company whose safety culture is lax is going to have greater of these um, these near misses. Yeah. You spoke about um, engineering companies, especially in the joint field, not having a regulatory body. Yeah. So when does a company exceed its uh, disregard to safety to have to be shut down? There's, okay, so the question is when does a company who is exceeding or, or uh, not, not providing safety, when should that company be shut down? I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I know in, in pharmaceuticals where I've worked, it's <coughs> regulated by the FDA and Health Canada, but they don't regulate safety. But it is implicitly regulated because if you're not running a safe environment, they will not allow you to manufacture that product. So it's, it's not explicitly enforced. But if you're going to run that risk, you're not going to be allowed to operate. In the, in the oil and gas industry, you don't have outside inspectors coming in always checking out the equipment. You do have some of the health and safety bodies coming in and citing. So in the video, we saw OSHA had multiple citations out on the company. But at best, they can find them. They can't shut them down. Great. I thought that the I thought OSHA could check you down. They can. They, they, they may be. Right? I don't, that's why I say I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what to what extent the regulations go to what is the point at where they can come in and say we're turning this facility off until we make these, take these actions. I certainly don't know of any cases where they have done use their authority to do that. I think it's more, I think a lot of countries will happen when it's putting the worker directly in danger. So things like, uh, breathing situations, like if it's a very dusty plant or if there's a lot of temperature regulations, if you have to add additional breaks for workers after over a certain temperature or humidity, and those sorts of regulations tend to push up down a plant for that, but I don't see how they could really regulate the large things like that. A lot of it that I'm aware of is it's always retroactive. It's after they've killed the worker that they've sent into a contained vessel filled with nitrogen and that work is asphyxiated or um, something along those lines that they get investigated. The worker falls off of the structure and they weren't wearing safety harness. So it's always retroactive. There's nothing proactive about the safety industry and that's, that's the unfortunate side. So a lot of this uh, in BP, in this particular case, that could have been avoided if proactive action had been taken. 
So we've just got a few more minutes here. What I thought to just uh, go through then is the final section here on pressure relief. Um, <coughs> So Dr. Marlon ended with these slides last time and says once we've got uh, our, our material being relieved from our vessel, there's a number of options to, to, to take it. One of course is uh, venting to the environment for very benign type material. The other is you hold it in a tank for so the process and we spoke about that. Then here uh, we have our other option to recycle back to the process. We can recover it as a fuel. Uh, so you flash it first and then you take, take part of that and uh, burn it as fuel. Or you can neutralize it by chemically or by flaring it. So uh, this I just wanted to talk about flaring here just because it came up in the, in the study yesterday. So here we've got a contained vessel, pressure relief valve. And if there's solids in the vessel, we can use a cyclone to separate them out. So here's, in, in the case where this pressure is too high, we can use a cyclone there. That's a great idea. It's totally not, it's totally mechanical device. There's no electrical requirements to operate that cyclone. We're relying purely on <coughs> the pressure from the reactor to push the material through the cyclone, separate out solids and liquids. Those can be contained in a quench tank. Gas stream then can be scrubbed from, to neutralize any of the chemical constituents. And then from there, we pass it through a seal pot. So then the vapor stream pass it through a seal pot to isolate the, that gas from, or to isolate this flare from just burning backwards. But there's also other technology in the flare to prevent that from happening. But this is a, a safety-ish uh, system, essentially, to then prevent that flare from back burning and then we flare it out. So that's a, a typical example. Here's uh, just some issues on flaring. <coughs> A number of you asked yesterday, would a flare even have helped? There were 52,000 gallons of fuel being um, retained in that vessel that were going to burn. So that was the number we, we heard in the video. That's a full tanker size. Would that have been able to be flared safely? And the answer is absolutely. Flares are designed to handle over a million, oh, oh, sorry, billions of BTUs per hour coming through. So they're, it's a phenomenal piece of engineering actually because these systems are designed to handle just the regular flow that comes out of a plant, that small flow rate, right up to a full contained plant venting. And flares easily exceed at 100 feet. So 30 meter flares are not uncommon um, and are in fact designed that way. So there's, in this article posted on the course website, you can act, there's a photo of a facility that is used to test flares, and you just basically see no grass around it. It's, um, <laughs> it's designed, designed for that. Now, the flares are also designed very carefully that height is sized appropriately so that the heat flux that you will receive as a person standing here on the ground, we can calculate that you will get blistering in 20 seconds if you receive a heat flux of 2,000 BTUs per hour per meter square. So that's a known number. So we designed these flares so that a person, the, high, the, the greatest heat exposure that a person will receive, which would be someone that's up here working on the tower, that heat flux should be no more than 1,500 BTUs per hour per meter square, so uh, per foot square. So there's, there's that, set, that tolerance that's built in. So the, the tower is sized appropriately for that, and then we flare up vertically. Um, we can also flare, as shown over here, you have multi-point flares. Um, so these are again to, to be away from the workers on the platform, which is a far more constrained environment. So very often we are constrained by the space around us, so the flaring system is sized appropriate for the environment. Do that manage a liquid stream, or is that just gas? It will manage a liquid stream, and that liquid stream as it's burning gets, gets burned convert it over to gas, which then creates a vacuum pulling more liquid in. But couldn't you essentially flood that flame? I flood the flame. Um, I don't think so. I think what would be designed would be something like this. Yeah, so as long as your containment here is sized appropriately ahead of the time, it could work. But that's a good question. I'm not sure about that. And in the case with the absorption of the heat, it seemed like there was a it wasn't just 
vaporous gas is also liquid gas. Gas and liquid, yeah. Uh, that's a good point. I never thought of the liquid side. Um, but these systems are designed to handle a full containment of, of liquid and solvent. I just don't know how they handle the liquid to regulate it. That's, I know it handles liquid, I just don't know how it does it. Um, there's also what are called ground flares, which so this is a company would have these on the ground in an enclosed shield. Okay. And they, these could be right in your neighborhood. So this is where a company can't build that small stack out either for optical reasons, they don't want to be seen to be flaring, but they have the need for flares during start and shutdown. So the advantage of this unit is that enclosure is preventing a visual um, view of the flame for optical purposes. It also prevents noise, which is, all, if you're in an open flare, there's a tremendous amount of noise, and it also prevents that heat flux from coming out. So, so there are some advantages to having these flares. They're no less safe than having a flare 100 feet up in the, in the air. These uh, flares also have uh, steam assist and pilots, so uh, we don't have too much time to go through this, but I'll just talk about it here quick. Um, so these, these are uh, pilots are, are the small flame that's always present to ensure that there is a source of ignition at the top, uh, since the flare may not always be operating. So there's always a pilot light there, and the pilot is, is heavily monitored. The pilot is monitored probably more than the flare itself. So we can always monitor a pilot uh, in multiple ways. There's always sound produced by a flame, so they'll have tubes there to, to take the sound, and that's monitored. Um, you can always monitor it by heat, so a thermocouple in the flare in the pilot's um, path. You can always monitor the ionization. The so flame has a lot of ionized particles, so that needs to be monitored. Um, and then you can use uh, infrared sensors to monitor the presence of the planet. So infrared cameras are very common to monitor. Steam assist is, um, is an interesting one. What we do is to get a smokeless flame, we'll inject steam. So it's counterintuitive to inject steam, but uh, we'll take high pressure steam and inject it into the flame, and that gives the flame more momentum and creates a longer flare. Why would you want a longer flare and a bigger flame? Which is more oxygen? Yeah, it's purely for mass transfer of oxygen. That is also the reason why you will see, uh, if you look at it, at it, at it, at it, so this is an example of a flare, you we'll get an impression of the size of that, multiple points of burning, so that you've got greater oxygen capacity to come in and, and keep it going. How about, uh, are they still a little bit of how much of the greenhouse gas? Would you rather have CO2 or liquid flames all around you? No, so, I mean, it's a good question. They're, they, they're not there for regular use. They're, they're there for emergency use. Um, I mean, you, that fuel that's ultimately being produced by the petrochemical company is going to come out as CO2 and H2O from the back of your source. You're just trying to just delay your time. Okay, so uh, take, take a look at this article. There's a number of interesting discussions on smokeless flares and all these flares.